Oh boy. So first, good afternoon. Uh, quick disclaimer, if you hear a baby screaming behind and a voice, it's my daughter. No one is being harmed. She's just found out that she has a voice box. So she's using every bit of that. And uh, uh, so just everybody is safe and sound over here, okay? Um, no, but that being said, I, I, I am humbly pleasant uh, at the fact that the last video I posted was a good success, at least in comparison to my recent videos. And uh, so I, I am, of course, very happy and I am, of course, very elated and, um, uh, and I'm incredibly thankful. And also in that process, um, as I was looking at the comments, I, I quickly realized that I cannot reply to all the comments because I was actually trying to reply to all the comments and I was like I'll be here all day um, so that was that was actually really, really quite funny but um, in the midst of replying to a lot of the comments you know a lot of people was asking me to tell you about my story and, uh, and so I I, uh, I call my mom and I ask if I if I have a permission and the reason why I I had to ask my mom that is because she is very much a big part of that story um, and so it, it will be only right that she gives gave a consent and because they are currently going through litigation um, you know I had to also talk with the lawyer in regards of that um, so uh, I got the. If you see this video, the lawyer approved it because I, I will have to show her this, and uh, and uh, and that's that. Now, more of a disclaimer um, is that my I'm not American. I am I'm from African descent, and I, I I'm um, I, I speak French fluently, so my thought process is in French. I know it might sound weird, but I think here in French, and it gets translated in English. So. A lot of times, and and I've, I've went to school, so a lot of times, the translation might not it might it might not be perfect. And as I get tired, or if I have other stuff in my mind, I don't translate correctly. And I know in some of the comments, some people uh, were like, "Is that what you meant? Is that what you said?" And I'm very well aware of that. I mean, throughout my whole life here in the U.S., it's something that people always said. It's like you know, I don't understand. What do you mean? I don't get it. Like, it's, I, I know because what's up here does not easily translate. And also the way we think French people is different than the way American think. So I'm, I'm very well aware that there is a language barrier, a bit very small, but there is. And it's one of my many um, contentions, so to speak, many points of, um, it's one of my many, many points of, I guess, insecurities when it comes to uh, communication is that my written is a lot better than my spoken I'm very well aware of that so again apologies if the information does not come out the way I maybe want it to come out uh, but just know it's it's uh, uh, it's always positive <laughs> positive is the wrong word just know it's it's I'm not I'm not a jerk I I, I tend to speak honestly about how I feel that's that I'm going to break this story into four parts and I apologize if it's going to be long, but I will try to be conscious of the fact that I don't want to take you whole day. And the first part is I'm going to explain to you the history of my parents, where they come from, how they met. I think that's important, right? Because it matters. The second part of the story is I'm going to explain to you based on my mother's opinion, uh, because obviously she lived with this man before we were born. And so I'm going to tell you a little bit of some of the situations that had happened before we were born. Um, the third part is I'm going to explain to you now situations when we were kids and also as teenagers and young adults, a situation that we were um, uh, present, so to speak. And the fourth part is going to be uh, entail all the information that led to the deliverance, that led to the series of actions that caused my mom to be in litigation. And, um, and in this portion, I'm also going to share with you why I said that we were lucky that we survived. Um, let's go. 
So my parents met in uh, Cameroon, Africa. That's where they are from. And uh, to give you more of an idea, my mother grew up in the city uh, and my father grew up in the countryside. Now, their prior generation, uh, women were not even allowed to really have a job or even work. It was kind of expected for you to be just a housewife. It was so antiquated. And also to make matters worth, worse is that um, the generation before my parents, it was absolutely normal if you had a child bride. It was actually normal if you were arranged to a child it was absolutely normal if a man had multiple... Oh, a butterfly just landed on the camera. Okay, focus. It was absolutely normal if uh, a man had multiple wives. In fact, it was abnormal if you were a man and you had one wife. And it was abnormal if your wife or any wives had a job. Keep that in mind because that's the mentality my father grew up living and knowing. Because in his house... He was, uh, he was, um, he was the the second born of the second wife, and there were four other women in the court. It's called a court. It's like a courtyard. It's a court, and uh, where my grandfather, so the father of my of my father, was the only man with four wives, and each wife wife had a a, a home like a, a little home like a tiny home if i had to give you a better perspective and he was violent he was sexually violent and it was not unusual for my grandfather to pretty much r-a-p-e you know his wives it was it was it was just a normal part of life and that's the environment my father grew up in and then if you compare contrast that to the environment my mother grew up in you know, my grandfather on my mother's side only had one wife. And he it was so frowned upon that he was kicked out of his village. And uh, not only did he have one wife, but my grandmother was a businesswoman. My grandmother w had, a, had a store, a candy store. It was at home. And not only did she have a store, but she also was a landlord. She had 12 properties on the same land that they that they had their main house on and she was renting those out and it was so frowned upon that my grandfather was threatened many 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 times because he was breaking status quo of society my sister my my not my sister i'm sorry my mother is a second born female and she has a younger sister, which is my aunt, and another younger sister, another aunt of mine, who unfortunately passed away. Now, um, my grandmother wanted wanted my the, the women, so her daughters, to be to have the freedom that her husband granted her, because my grandfather did not have to give her that right. My grandfather loved my grandmother so much that he allowed her to, to be able to express herself and grow. And because it was so frowned upon for women to have jobs that my grandmother had no choice but to start a business because nobody would hire her. And that's an important story because this is the seed. This is how my grandmother grew up and my mother grew up in that type of environment because that freedom is what my father did not like. And it was the basis of all their fights. So my father met my mother when he was 33 years old. And he was already working for the United Nations at a very high position. I mean, he had a Corvette at the time. And in Africa, that was uh, like a very expensive. And he had like a high-rise penthouse apartment in the city, you know. And at the time, that was very expensive. He was the bachelor. And my mother you know, was leaving class at 23 years old. She was just uh, uh, finishing college and she was leaving class with her best friend. She crossed the street and my father saw her and pretty much heckled her and almost stalked her because she was not interested. And he would, um, uh, she denied his advances many times, but he would not let go. And he, he would show up to, to, to school. He would stalk her in his car. I mean, looking back, that was so un, such an unhealthy behavior. But, you know, 
as my mom said at the time it was it was weird but it was kind of sexy and he was a very very rich man and he was into me and he was talking me and you know my my mom had has a very kind soul and i think because she was raised properly and i think my father pinpointed the fact that this girl is probably going to be easy to manipulate and at the beginning my, unfortunately my mom was so uh long story short for this first part that's how they met. My father was very persuasive. And one day he said to my mom, let me invite you to one of my parties. So, you know, it was not unusual to have soiree in the UN. And, and so he invited her to this soiree and she didn't want to go, but her best friend who was right there was like, come on, let's go for a party. It's just a party. And so they went together and throughout, throughout the entire party. And my father was, of course, not really pleasant in terms of his physical, uh, he was very pushy. And uh, keep in mind his mindset of what my dad probably thought of women, and uh, he didn't he didn't assault her or anything. But she left the party a little bit uncomfortable, and she tried to break up with him. In other words, saying like, "Look, I'm I, I thank you for the help. I'm not really that interested." And my father flat out said to her, "He's like, I know you're not interested, but I will make you interested." And in a weird way, you know, my mom, of course, she was very unnerved by that, and she went back home and she told her her father her mother and she told her best friend about what he said and everybody uh, uh was like ah it's all good ah, he's just being a boy and keep in mind that this isn't this is a time where there's a transitional period between different mindset right it would just became okay for women to have their freedom for women to have a job and so the old mentality of the the, the way men used to think was still there and so and so People didn't really have as many red flags as they would have today in such behavior. And um, and so he would be persistent. He would show up to a school to the point where she was like, fine, I give you a date, but I only go with my best friend. And they went on a date and the best friend went and her best friend was like, he's not so bad. He's not so bad. And then eventually she kind of cave in and, um, and when she uh, allowed herself to date my father, my father was actually really quite pleasant, very quite nice. He was showing her with affection. He was, you know, he was going above and beyond and he wooed her and, uh, she, you know, and, and that's how, that's how he ended up sticking to her. Does that make sense? Okay. Okay, so now that you understand how my parents sort of met, which is not in a very healthy kind of way, now we're going to go into the point where once they got married or right before the marriage, because that's where my mom says as soon as they got married, that's when things just changed. Um, customary uh in cameroon if you want to at the time if you wanted to marry someone you have to give a diary to the parents of the bride and my father was like i'm not giving shit so my father refused to give the diary and it was a big deal because my mother loved the parents and that was what her parents really wanted my father to do and he fought my grandparents on that and so my grandfather didn't want to upset his daughter was like look i accept not to take your diary but you cannot you cannot accept the diary in return for your daughters. Look, the whole diary situation, I'm, it doesn't really matter. I'm just trying to paint the picture for you in terms of his personality. And that's... Uh, anyway, so um, uh, they get married. And they get married at the Justice of the Peace. Because my father, my mother wanted a big wedding. She wanted to invite her family members. She wanted to do it at the church and my father said yeah of course we'll do it we'll do it but first let's do it at the justice of the peace and sign the paper and so my mom did and she didn't want to of course but she said she noticed that he was getting you know very rowdy and a little bit uh like high tone of voice and she's like you know what i don't want to create issues so i'm just going to concede and and do it as soon as my mom signed and got married at the justice of the peace my father completely ignored the fact that you know, let's go ahead and do it at the church. And my mom was pressing the issue. Hey, you know, my family members didn't see me get married. And she couldn't understand why he would not go forward with the what he initially said. So she pushed, of course, rightfully so she pushed. I mean, I'm getting married. I want my family to see me married. And that's the first instance 
according to my mom, that my father turned around and said, you don't tell, like, just like that. You don't tell me what to do. I, uh, uh, whatever I say goes. Just like that. And she was very surprised. She was shocked. And not only did he just spur out this thing, but uh, he didn't let go. He started berating her. You know, your parents, who do you think you are? You think just because your father allowed your mom to work that you, you're you just going to come in here and do whatever you want. I'm the man of the house. I'm the man of the house. I set the rules. I make the rules. And um, my mom was very surprised and she was very shocked. And uh, that first incident, she did not react and respond. And, uh, and I asked her, as she was telling me the story, I asked her why. And she said because she was processing the fact that she just got married to potentially someone she may have made a mistake. And she didn't want to face reality. And she did not want to tell her parents that incident. Because, you know, to her it was like my father, you know, um, renounced custom just to get me married and now i'm gonna go back and tell him oops it was a big mistake so she felt ashamed and she didn't know who to turn to because the girlfriends the girlfriends at the time that she had it was normal to be abused and she was just frightened at the fact that oh my god i just maybe married someone who's going to be abusive to me and she just froze she just froze and um, so, of course, typical narcissist, the next day, he was like, oh, I'm so sorry. That's not what I meant. I had a terrible day. And he bought her like, he, he bought her gift. And, and he was so sweet, so nice that she was kind of like, okay, well, maybe, maybe it was just one, one, of, the, one of the moments. And, um, and so she, she kind of put it in the back of her mind. Again. I apologize if this is very choppy because it's, there's a lot of stuff that I really, I don't feel super comfortable bringing it up on my emotional psyche uh, because I've, I've done a lot of therapy and, uh, you know, I, I love my mom dearly. Uh, you know, we, we, have a, we have our problems separate from my dad. Uh, but uh, as, as a kid, I've always felt unsafe at home and I've always, I've, I've, I've blamed, I blame my parents for it, but I've, I've, I used to blame my mom for not protecting me because I knew my dad didn't love me, but I knew my mom loved me. And I've, I've, I've always wondered why did she try harder to protect me? And through a lot of intestine therapy, I had to understand that she was a victim and she didn't know how. And many, many times my mother wanted to divorce. And I understood, understand now the reason why she didn't divorce is because she didn't know what he would do to us um, because at least even though she was being abused at home she had somewhat of a control of our upbringing this is I'm, I'm saying it from what she said I'm not saying it as if this is something that you should be doing I personally don't think that's something you should be doing because because as a parent, if I'm not okay, my daughter cannot be okay. And so, and so it's important as a parent that you try to put your, your well-being first so you could be better prepared to help. And my mom was just mentally shattered. And I, I, think, I think what kept her going through is her job. It's her job because she would get beaten for having a job. And to give you a perspective, to give you more of a perspective, her job, my father worked, my, my, fa my father was a uh, the director in the UN, uh, in, um, oh, I forgot the title, but he was in charge of the, Asia, of the Asia division. My mother was in charge of the Africa division. So nothing went through the United Nations. So you have the, uh, uh, the general person, and then you have, you know, somebody else. And then you have uh, the, the gatekeeper, the people in charge of divisions. So nothing in Africa happens without my mother's approval. And nothing in Asia happened without my father's approval. Do you understand? Especially when it came to monetary. So their positions were very high up. 
and they were there was no such they didn't answer to one another and there was no such thing as a, a, a subordinate they were side grades they pretty much had the same job and they were making almost the same amount of money and my father couldn't stand that because I, because you know he wanted to have full control of her and he knew he knew that if she had a job or an income she had a possibility to escape So, ultimately, what happened is, as he was apologizing, he agreed to do the wedding to the church. And, this is going to sound crazy, y'all. But, do you know when they actually had that church wedding? When I was four years old. And I remember that day very clearly because he made a big scene at the church. And so I asked my mom, I said, so when he came to you and apologized that he would do the wedding, what happened in between? Why did he wait four years to get it done? My mom replied to me and said, because I had to deal with another problem. And that problem was much more important than this damn wedding. My father wanted my mom to not work. My father wanted my mother to be a stay at home mom. And my mom said to my dad that absolutely not. My mother, so my grandmother, was never a stay-at-home mom. I went to school. I went to college. Like, there is no way I went through all that. And my parents pay all this money just for me to sit at home and not work. And she even said to my dad, like, I'm able-bodied. I can contribute to the household. I can do it. And my father said, nope, I make enough money for both of us. You're my wife. Your job is to be home cook meals, have sex with me. He did say that. Have sex with me, give me children, and obey. And my mother at that moment said, this is like, she said, she said to me, I can, I can ignore anything else, but I will never ignore the fact that I need to work because it just doesn't feel right. And let me tell you something, guys. If my mother had conceded to that, she would be not alive today because it's thanks to her job that this litigation situation is going successfully. Thanks to the fact that she had a career that she was able to defend herself in front of courts. Because let me tell you something, it is not cheap. And if my mother was, if my mother didn't stand her ground in that, in that aspect, she would be entirely financially dependent on him. And it, it would have been a whole different story today. Because she fought so hard for her right to go to work that that's when the physical violence started. So obviously she didn't care about the wedding at the time because she was being beat. She was being beaten at the fact that she wanted to go to work. And the way he would beat her, he would beat her like, like, like a child. He would not beat her in the face. My mother is very pretty. And uh, I'm not saying that to be, uh, to be a dick. I'm just saying that because a lot of times when she would go to work and big uh, conventions and whatever, whatever, you know, and, you know, it's, it's a different time. But men would be like, wow, your wife is so pretty. And, you know, I think with my father, he realized that, hey, if he beat her in places that people could see bruises, it would be not great. So he would he would hit her like a child, like at, at, the, at the thigh, at the butt, punch her maybe at the stomach. Like it would be anywhere except places that you would really see. And oh, that would be very obvious, you know. And, uh, but my mother would fight back and she's a woman, she's a woman. She could only, she could only fight back so much. Right. And every time she fought back, she will obviously lose the fight, but she fought back. And she said, she said to him many times, you will not take away my ability to work. I will not concede that. And it went on for four years. It hurt her when she was pregnant. It hit her when we were babies it he would beat he would beat her and i and as a four-year-old kid i will remember i remember very well when my father was violent to my mom and i remember that one of my coping mechanism as a four-year-old child was there was this yellow truck that i had in my in my toy in my toy box and i would I would play with that truck and I would make vroom, 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 vroom. I would make this very loud noise to drown the, the noise of the, the fighting. And it was, it was thump, punch. I mean, it was, my mom would fight back. 
she would fight back and it was always around that topic. My father hated the fact that my mom would come back from work. If my father was home before my mom, she would get a beating. It would, because, because he'd be like, where's the dinner? Where's this? And my parents were very wealthy. They had enough money to hire a cook, a cleaner, a nanny. But my father was like, no, that's your job. So she would, would get us up in the morning, get us to school, go to work, come back, make dinner. I mean, I don't even know how she did it. And she, and, she, and I asked her, she said, I don't know. She said she was an autopilot. But she was saying that it's because she knew that if she gave up that right to be able to have an income, that she would, she would die. It's almost like she instantly knew. She said, I need to be able to, to, to have my money so I can, I can escape. <sighs> now we are a little older. And it's kind of not really a secret anymore that mom and dad get into fights. And, um, but you know, there was never really true, uh, I want to say proof because we couldn't see any bruises on my mom. And, uh, so I was specifically 16 years old, you know, a young man, young man going through hormones, dealing with, dealing with his own personal issues of being gay, African, uh, a Catholic family, like going through my own little problems. And my father, I guess, forgot not to hit my mom in the face. And they got into another scuffle. And I was saying to myself, oh, it's just another one. It was just to, to give you an idea of how normal it was. And the fight was around that specific, that specific fight was because my mom paid the bills. The bill was $2,000. It was a credit card bill. And she just made the payment. She had the money. She made the payment. And my father lost it. And he said, you know, like, I'm the man of the house. I pay the bills. You don't pay the bills. I told you, I told you, I told you. And my mom didn't even respond because it was kind of like whatever. And it was a Saturday. And the whole, the whole, we were all home. Nobody was at school. Nobody was at work. And I was woken up by this scream. And I, it was nothing new. But the distinct newness was my mom made a screech. And that was new. That was a new sound. And to give you an idea of how I even identified the different sound of my mom, and it became such norm, normal normalcy. And she made a different sound. And then I, I, I was like, okay, well, that's different. What is that? And then I ran into the room. And then I opened the door, and my father was punching her. She was on the bed, and he was punching her in the face. And so I, uh, of course, there's a shock. My sister you know, also heard the same screech. It's so funny how she also showed up and my sister cries and she, she runs over and shields my mom. She runs like, my father is on top of her, right? And she runs like right on top and she shields my mom from the punches. And she's screaming, stop, stop. And I was, I was frozen. I didn't move, I just stared. And you know, I, I had this stupid sweater and my underwear and uh, and barefoot. I mean, I, I was I was sleeping. And my father got up. My mom is like, I'm so sick of just screaming. And I remember she said, she's like, do you think you could come here and beat me? You can come here and beat me and, and I'm just going to seek you and take it? Who do you think you are? And she, and she said, like, enough. That's enough. And she told my sister, my Paula, get off me. Get off me. And my, my sister was like, no, mommy, no, 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 no. And my sister was older than me. My sister's two years older. She's probably 18. And she's like, get off me. You want to fight? My mom was like, you want to fight? I'm ready. Let's go. And I, I'm just frozen. My dad, realizing that we all saw it, just stopped. And he just walked away to his office and just worked. And my mom took pictures of it. She... Uh, analyzed the, the, the she put she catalog, uh, catalog the pictures and then uh she said okay i'll start. take a picture take a picture she goes like that she takes a picture i take a picture but i was still frozen it was you know this old school picture where you had to develop the film and and i i i i, I think i zoned out because then everything becomes a little blurry to me and i have i have to have my my mother recount what happens next because i don't quite remember and when I spoke with her and I said, what happened next? 
she said um, she took the she took the film and she stashed it away in a secret box and um, and apparently that box had all of the bruises that he's been giving her through the ages and um, and so so what okay I'm gonna skip that that's uh, that's making me feel a little bit uncomfortable I'm gonna skip that as a child you know your your home is supposed to be your safe place and as a child you know the one thing you don't have to really worry or work on is the trust of your environment you just automatically assume it's safe and as a parent I'm a parent now and as a parent when I look at my daughter she looks at me with utter trust she doesn't even think that I would drop her she doesn't you know it's like it's not even computing in her mind that I could put I could hurt her in any way the one time in life where you don't have to work for trust is when you're a parent and it's such a sacred duty because it's so hard to to earn someone's trust it's such a sacred duty that I couldn't understand how my father didn't love me enough to secure my trust and at the time I didn't understand and at the time, I also didn't understand why my mom would allow her children to be in an unsafe space. But I didn't understand that she was also a victim. And even though she was very powerful at keeping her job, she was filled with, with self-esteem issues. She was an abused woman emotionally, psychologically, physically. And I later found out sexually. It was not unusual for my father to just force himself on her. And, and it was not unusual for my father to force himself on my aunts, the sister of my mother, who we just found out about recently. And um, I'm going to say alleged. <laughs> I think, if, lawyer, if you're watching this, you're probably like, okay, he said alleged. Alleged, allegedly, 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 um, because that's not quite sorted out. Uh, but it's it's on the way to be sorted out, but it's not quite sorted out. So let's just say allegedly. Um, so when I mentioned that we survived the kids, it's because every single one of us had an instance that was so severe um, that we okay me personally when I was 16 when the incident happened when I witnessed my father beat my mom in the face I I think I had a nervous breakdown and I was no longer able to distinguish between laughter and screams. Everything sounded like a scream to me. You could be laughing and I'd be thinking you're, you're screaming of pain. And so it became unbearable because, you know, p people would laugh, but I would think they're being assaulted and I would just run over and help. And when I got to college, it became even more problematic because you know you're in college right people laugh all the time you're at a party people laugh I just saw people being assaulted everywhere I looked I, I couldn't make a distinction between a woman screaming and a woman laughing it just all sounded the same and I had a nervous breakdown I was in my dorm and I almost jumped off the window I, uh, I, I called my mom I was, I was I remember that so vividly so at school they had these cubicles where you can make phone calls and they're soundproof you can make phone calls outside of your room if you did, if you wanted to have privacy and you want to you didn't want to talk while your roommate is there so they had these cubicles in the hallway that was soundproof and 
and it's, it's glass so people, people can see through right and every cubicle I don't know why they did that but every cubicle had a window access so I called my mom and I was telling her I'm upset and I was really crying uh, really crying and she was like I don't understand what's going on what's happening it's someone there someone hurting you and she I, I, I couldn't tell her it's because her husband was the cause and then my mom made a mistake she's like okay I don't know what's going on want me to drive over there I said no and then she's like well speak to your father maybe he can help and she passed the phone to my dad <laughs> and he's like Alistair are you okay acting all concerned and I, I just shattered I shattered and I hung up the phone and I, I don't know if it's if it's God, but I got I opened the window, and I I I I, I literally was out, <laughs> and I was dangling from the window. I was I was dangling from the window, and uh, and I and I was ready to let go. I don't know why anybody saw, there was nobody around. Because if there was somebody around, they um, uh, they would have taken action, and uh, you know they they, they have they have a, a way to deal with suicide there. Um, but there was nobody around, and nobody saw it. And in hindsight, good thing nobody saw it because. If someone saw it, it would have been a huge deal at school. I would have been taken out of campus. I would have been put into, into, into help. And it would have prevented me from, I don't know what I'm talking about. I'm a little uncomfortable talking about it. It's making me feel a certain kind of way. Um, and you know, I, ever since I was 19 years old, actually, this is when I decided to take therapy. At that moment, at 19, at that moment, that's the day where I looked down and I said, "If I let go," and I was in a special building. I, it was, it was uh, uh, four four stories high. There was no way I was surviving this. Even if I was to survive this, I would shatter my legs and bleed to death. And I looked down and I was hanging by the window and I said, I said, Alistair, you know, if, if you, if you die, if you die, no one will protect your mom. If you die, no one will protect her. And so I, you know, I work out. So I pull myself up, I went inside, inside the, the, the thing. I closed the, the window. And I went to bed. I went to bed. And I said to myself as I was going to bed, this is not healthy. You need to figure this out. And the next morning, I, um, the school, you know, they have, they have a mental health facility. And I walked over and I told the, to the, to the psychiatry, de uh, psychiatry department, psychiatry department, they have like somewhere on the campus, very far away in the woods, like it's nice and relaxing. I said, I'm going through a moment. They asked me if not bunch of questions, did you try to commit whatever? Of course I lied. And I said, no, but I need to talk to someone. And, uh, and I went and I talked to someone. And, um, and that, was, that was the beginning of my therapy journey because ever since 19 years old, I've always seen a therapist, always seen a therapist. And I don't want to share what my other siblings went through because I didn't ask for their permission. But there's five of us total, uh, four siblings. Every single one of us went through a situation that could have ended them. I'm a little shaky, I apologize, because I'm trying to keep everything in. Um, and I'm going to take a little break. I had to move. Because they are, I don't know what they're doing over there. It's noise. Uh, I 
maybe I need to anyway so one thing to understand is that I apologize for the noise and I can't go inside the house because the baby is crying when you are a child of a narcissist you will always have a little bit of what they have from my understanding no children of true narcissists come out normal they come out with issues they come out with triggers they come out with something it's almost like a legacy like a, a gift from their narcissistic parents and that gift can be in any way shape or form it could be either you 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 feel insecure or you feel inadequate or you want to please authority there's always a trauma issue that they imprint on you because as a child when you look at your parents you are just you take everything from that from them right you're, you're it's, they are your parents they're, they're your parents so why would you think otherwise that they are dangerous to you as a child you don't know that and it's only when you grow up when you're older that you realize that their influence affected your your life and your teenage years or your grown-up years. I can tell you how my father narcissism has affected the way I live. I make no mistake about that, that I am my father's son. Sorry. As unfortunate as that is, I am his son. And part of him is in me and so and it's also in my siblings and we the, the, the good thing is, is that we recognize that and we are aware of that and that helps in mitigating some of the some of the the, the uh, uh, how you deal with other people who are not like that and it's important to realize that fact because um, I have a very short temper. I have my father's temper. It may not look like it, but I have my father's temper. And and I, I am emotional like my mom. And so you combine the two together and it's, it's not, I had to learn. I had to learn to walk away, literally. And it's always been a fear of mine ever cross that line with my spouse I don't think that will happen but I'm also a believer <laughs> never say never I believe that I believe in that and this is actually harder than I thought this is harder than I thought um, um, So me and Christopher, we have, we have a safe word. Um, whenever, because Christopher, Christopher has met my father, he has, and he knows my dad and wh what he's capable of, and what he's done, because he was part of. He, he at the time we were boyfriends, we were not married, and we have a saying, me and Christopher, we have a safe word, which is whenever I act like my father. Because sometimes I don't realize some of the stuff I do. He says to me, he's like, you're acting like Ernest. And I have to say, and I have to give me credit for that, is that whenever he says that, I trust that he's knowledgeable enough to know and re realize what I'm doing at that moment that will make him say that. And immediately I, I stop talking, I stop what I'm doing. And, I, and I, I, I look for him for guidance in terms of like, okay, what do I do next to go back to normal? Um, and even though every fiber of my being is like, no, nah, you're fine, but I, I trust him enough to know when he says you're being like, you're, you're, being, you're acting like Ernest, I, I trust to say that it's, it's bad enough that he, if he has to say that, I need to stop. I need to stop and reevaluate what I'm doing. I'm sorry guys, 
I am shaking. I'm shaking. I'm going to take a little break and I'm going to move on. My mother survived. It's because it's literal. I speak, I will speak from my mother's side. And that I know I can speak about because that was resolved in court. And I'll tell you the outcome. So throughout their history of abuse and the day, the moment when my father beat her, when, when I was 16 year old, beat her in the face, my mom, my mom, we were living in a, in a, in a very fancy building at a time. And so my mom said, you know, you're not going to, I'm done with that. So she bought, she bought an apartment next door. And so the way that my parents would live, so stupid, but they would like two weeks out of the month, they each would travel to the other person's apartment. there will be a couple and then they will go back to their respective home. It's almost like being like divorced without being divorced. You know what I mean? So like for the month of January, two weeks in January, my dad would go to my mom's house. And then two weeks later, he would go back to his house. And then February, two weeks, my mom would go to my dad's house. And it would go like that. And because I was 16, you know, of course I, you know, I chose to live with mom, okay? But, you know, I'm number four out of five kids. And my younger brother, the number five, was going to boarding school. So there was no, there was no kids at home, really. Because once I got to college, there was no need, right? So it, it kind of worked. Now, why is that important? Because that strategy allowed them to, I guess, coexist. And so, I'm sorry, I moved the camera. And so they did that when my, when my father bought properties in Canada. My mom stayed here in the U.S. They did that. Except now they had to take an airplane and come to the other person's home. And so the incident when my father literally almost killed my mom was when it was a typical, it was a typical routine. It was her month to travel. And I always got scared, always got scared every time she went to his house to the point where I'm sorry. At one point I told my mom, I said, you need to stop doing that. And I think I was 21 at the time. I said, you need to stop doing that because I think it's going to kill you. Um, my mom was like, no, you know, he can beat me, but he could never kill me. <laughs> anyway, just, that's the victim's brain. So every time she would go to Canada, I, I, me and my mom will have this thing where, okay, you text me when you leave the house. You text me when you land. You call me when you arrive. And I call you every day. And the reason why I did that is because in my, in my mind, I said, if something happens to you, mother... I want to have a timestamp as to where to start looking. I want to be able to show the police something as to like, this is where I last contacted her. And so we did that. So she, she said, I'm leaving. I'm in the bus. Um, she took the bus that day. She didn't want to fly. And she arrived. She called me. I could hear my dad in the background. And he's like, hello, Alistair. I was like, hello. You know, blah, 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 blah. And... And at night, I would just call her to make sure she was okay. And it was a, a typical night of the day, right? I, I called. I called. They picked up the phone. I mean, she picked up the phone, and she was having a prayer. And, you know, they, they, they have a big house there. So she, she just went in an, an, another room. And, you know, we, we, me and my mom, we laugh a lot, right? We laugh. And so we're just typical. We laugh. And... And then I can hear from the phone and my father did not know I was on the phone. And that's an important feature. So my father just burst open the door and said to my mom, put down the phone and go to bed. And my mom is like, uh, excuse me? My dad is like, put down the phone and go to bed. My mom is saying, no, I'm on the phone with Alistair. No, get out of here, right? My father, um, sorry, she didn't say with Alistair. She said, I'm on the phone with someone. I apologize. I just said Alistair because I'm telling the story. Sorry. No, a phone with someone. And I'll tell you why, why, um, later on, my father had no idea it was me. But anyway, so, uh, he lunges at her, knocks the phone out of her hand, 
and she's I can hear her scream. The phone wasn't hang up, it's a cell phone. And they fight. And from my end, I hear noises, scuffle, fights, and then and then it went silent. I can hear like almost like my mom gasping for air. And I hear my father say, I'm gonna kill you, then I'm gonna kill myself. So, of course, like the inner child, I just froze on the phone. I froze. And I, 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 I hate myself for it. But I was in another state. And I could hear, literally, my mom being murked over the phone. So, um, the phone went completely silent. He said what he said. And then he let go. He let go. For whatever reason, he let go. And uh, I could hear the gasps of air. So it went silent, and then it went... <clears throat> and I could hear her cough. And I I, 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 I want to say I blacked out. I don't think I blacked out. But what I remember is getting on the phone with my sister and telling my sister, who was, also, who was in Canada at the time, Please call 911. I think I think that is killing mom. And my sister was like, okay. Didn't ask questions. Okay. My dad walked away. He walked away to the other room. My mom, knowing I was on the phone, well, I think she knew. She grabbed the phone. She was crying. And she was saying, on, 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 and I couldn't understand what she was saying. It was she was going in and out of English and French, screaming, crying. I said to my mom, "Lock the door, lock the door." I said it peacefully, "Lock the door, lock the door, lock the door, lock the door." Lock the door. And uh, we we called the police. The police arrives. They arrive with my sister, who was pregnant, eight months, and my father is cleaning the dishes he's in the kitchen a kitchen cleaning the dishes saying like oh hello how can i help you and the police is like we've heard disturbance of domestic violence my father's like no not at all not at all and when they when my mom of my sister is like mom 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 looking for mom my mom comes out she had 10 finger marks on her neck mom my mom has a if you've seen my mom she has a very delicate neck she has one of the skinniest neck I've ever seen. And like it's, it's like to see 10 marks, I can't even imagine how, how, how much, it's almost like he, like, like he could just snap her neck. It's, in, it's ridiculous. 10 marks on her neck. And the police saw the marks. And my father went on and did this story. And the police was like, no, you you come into the station. Like, look what we like. There's ten fingers on her neck, and that's when my father was brought to Canadian jail, and that's the beginning of their divorce proceeding. And my father, my mother, never been in the same room with my dad ever since that day, and that happened in 2016. Well, the end of 2015, beginning of 2016. That's when it happened. And in jail, my father, there's a bond, of course. In jail, my father contacts me and asks me to pay for the bond. He had no idea. He's like, your mom called the police. She made up a story that I tried to kill her, that I strangled her, and now I'm in jail. Come post bond. And he had no idea I was on the phone. And when he sent me that text message, and then I didn't respond, then he sent an email with the whole fabricated story of what happened, that he was he just he just came back from the tennis, he took a shower, he was just having a good time in the kitchen. My mom berated him. My mom uh, uh, put his finger in his face and uh, and assaulted him, and he was just hanging out. And my mom threatened to call the police and make up this story. He had no idea that I was on the phone the entire time because my dad had no idea of this checking system my mom and I had. And when I saw that, I, 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 again, I realized that, you know what? My father is capable of lying like that. What else is he capable of doing? 
and you know 2016 is really when i started to to see truly like what is that and that's when i i started to research on what a what a narcissist is and even when he went to court because in canada if you have the domestic violence situation it's no longer you versus the victim it's you versus the state and i believe that because he was a first time offender they took his his uh, prison sentence which was supposed to be 14 years and they turned that into 14 years probation and because probation I guess is not fun so my father uh, decided to leave the country of Canada and go to Cameroon and he would just only come back during the litigation and the courts proceedings of the divorce which is going very nasty and to go back again to the issue of my mom having her, her job, it's because my father always find a way to postpone the court. He goes on social media, looks up at what I may have posted, what I may have said. He probably gonna see this video and he's gonna go to the court and say, look, 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 and he's going to invent something my father brought the Cameroonian Supreme Court to Canada. For what reason? I have no idea. Because they were, they were dismissed. He brought four judges. They were dismissed. Canada said, you have no jurisdiction here. Get out. But even though he's unsuccessful, those proceedings prolongs the court. And you could clearly see that he's attempting to financially drain my mom or drag her on. But the reason why he's not successful at doing that is because my mom got money. And if my mom didn't stick to her career, she would be like plenty of women at the mercy of the financial power of their husbands who would be trying to, to force them to submission by prolonging divorces. There's no child support. We're all grown. Since 2016, the only thing in contest, the only thing in contest is the properties that they have to split. That's it. And the pension, and uh, and because uh, uh, they work for the UN before when the UN was great. So there's a lot of money there uh, post-retirement. That's all they have to fight about. And it's very easy. They don't have a prenup. It's everything divided 50-50, and that's that. But my father always finds a way to prolong the divorce proceeding. And because they have a lot of assets, the court needs six days to divide six days to divide the assets. So when a when a court gets postponed, it gets postponed to next year. So it's not like postponed to the next few months. Next year, because the court needs six days. There are four judges on my mother's case. Four judges on my mother's case. There's assets in Africa, assets in France, assets in Canada, assets in the US. Pension to divide. And my mother said very clearly, you could buy me out and leave me alone or combine the value of everything, divide it in half, and that's it. And for some reason, my father finds a way to postpone it. But you know what? Next year in March is the final court date because the court told my dad, you cannot postpone anymore. And they will have their, their final divorce next year in March. And I can tell you, and by then I can tell you more of the details in relation to the divorce. That's what I cannot say because that's not finalized. And I would hopefully tell you the alleged results of the sexual situation for my father and my aunt. And one of them unfortunately passed away. And then when that's over, I will tell you the situation between my father and my uncle, his brother, because my uncle is no longer alive. And the last person he saw was my dad. And that's all I can say, allegedly. I'll tell you a secret. I had to pause many times and because I was starting on the verse to cry and I, I had to pause and, 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 and stop it because I don't know. I, I'm not a I'm not a pretty crier. I'm a I'm a I'm a stupid crier. Um, but it's also I, I I I'm learning to be comfortable being vulnerable in front of the camera. You know, it's it's uh, this YouTube thing is a is a learning process for me. It's also very therapeutic. Um, I'm gonna take more of your time if you let me. 
Um, but I started this channel. You know what? Maybe I'll do another video because I think I took a lot more of your time. I'll do another video where I tell you more about why this channel was a lifesaver for me. And, uh, yeah. Yeah, why, why, why this channel was a life serve for me and it, it saved my life again. Uh, I'll tell you more about another video. <laughs> wow. Thank you. I, I don't know how well this video will do. <laughs> Um, I, I don't enjoy talking about myself too much, but uh, because I, I like to be private, but I also know the importance when you share how that how good it feels for you, the person who shares it. But how maybe you can help someone else. I'm aware of that because I've I've been helped by listening to other people. I've been helped with that, so I understand that power there, and I am I am humbly thankful. Humbly thankful. Oops. <laughs> that, was, that was a bug. <laughs> a bug flew right in my eye. Like, are they fucking blind? A bug's blind. Do you not see that there's something here? Why do you gotta come, like, right in here? What the, what the, what the fuck? I guess that's the price I pay for being outside. Anyway, guys, bye. Um, uh, I, I, I try to post something quickly about what, why this channel and how important it is to me. And then I will do my best to bring you content that you like. So more commentaries. I will do my best to do that. And to do it well. And to not disappoint. And, uh... Uh... Oh, man. Thank you. Thank you. It's a little surreal. And you know what? It's like in the grand scheme of things, you know, it's some of them might say, Oh, my God. It's just 500 subscribers. Like, I know it sounds silly, but I, I am so thankful and, and baffled it's uh I'm, I'm, I'm surprised and i'm very happy and um it's awesome bye guys of course like subscribe goodbye thank you